Hi everyone, I'm Niels and I'm making simulations of billiards and other systems in mathematics and physics and recently I've started also making some explanatory videos. So this is the second video. The first one was more of a technical nature, so on how to make billiard simulations. So today I'd like to speak about a particular type of billiard, which are unilluminable rooms. And uh, the reason is, I think uh, this is mathematically quite interesting. And I also recently gave a talk to some school kids and they seem to like it. So I hope you will like it too. Now, let me start by uh, explaining or recalling what is the illumination problem. So the question was originally posed in the early 1950s by mathematician Ernst Strauss. And the question is, if you have a room with mirrored walls, so all walls are covered by mirrors, is it always possible to light it entirely with a single light source? Now, to be precise, we assume that the room is in one piece, what we call connected in mathematics. And we also work in the approximation of geometrical optics, which means that light moves in straight lines, so we ignore diffraction and interference phenomena and so on. So who was Ernst Strauss? Here uh, is a picture of him. So he was born in Germany in 1922 and in the early 1930s, because he was Jew, for obvious reasons, he immigrated to, to Israel with his family and later to the United States, where he worked for a few years as an assistant of Albert Einstein and uh, then later on got a position uh, at UCLA, where he uh, worked for the rest of his life. Now, the first answer to this question, the first counterexample, was provided by Roger Penrose a few years later, in 1958. And here you have a simulation of the best known solution, which is uh, made of several arcs of ellipses and straight lines. So what you see on this simulation is there are three different light sources in different colors, and none of these is able to light the whole room. And you can actually prove that you will never be able to put a single light source in such a way that it will light the entire room. Now, I don't want to talk more about this particular solution. There are many other places where this is done. For instance, Steve Mould has a very nice video on that. And I would rather like to talk about polygonal solutions. So mathematicians are like that. They often, when they have solved a problem, they want to make it more difficult and see if they can still solve it with this added level of difficulty. So Penrose's solution uh, uses parts of ellipses. So is it possible to do the same with polygons? And the first positive answer was provided by George Tokarski, who is at University of Alberta in Calgary, in 1995. And he found this polygon with 26 sides. And it has the property that if you put a light source, let's say here on the wet point, then you will not be able to illuminate the gray cross at the right. So it is not as strong uh, as Penrose's solution in the sense that you can light almost everything, but there is at least there's this one point you cannot light if you put the light source on this other point. And of course, you can switch the walls of the wet point and the gray cross. And uh, a couple of years later, David Castro found a solution with only 24 sides. Now, one can wonder whether it is possible maybe to uh, find polygons which have larger areas that you can cannot light. And there's a 
was a recent negative result by Samuel Lelievre, Thierry Monte, and Barack Weiss that says that if all angles of the polygon are rational, so in degrees, so rational multiples of 360 degrees, then there's at most a finite number of points that cannot be lit. In other words, there may be no point at all, but if there are points, there are only finitely many points. So th that is an extremely strong generalization, and I will come back to it uh, at the end of the talk. There's also a more recent strengthening saying that there will always be a, num uh, a finite number of pairs of points that cannot light each other, like two in these cases there. All right, but how does this Tokarski solution work? I mean, the first time I saw this solution, I wondered how on earth did uh, Tokarski think of such a room? And it turns out that it's actually not so hard to understand why it works. Of course, finding the, the solution is, is all the work. So let's first look at this simulation that you also find on my channel. So here I started with 16 particles. They start at the left point, which is shown in red here. Now the number of particles is decreasing. That is because I'm assuming here that the angles are absorbing. So whenever a trajectory, a particle hits a corner, it just disappears. And what you see uh, here uh, in the middle top of the simulation is a zoom of the neighborhood of the green point, which is here in the right half of, uh, of the room. And you see that even though some uh, of the particles or light rays come pretty close to it, they never quite touch this point. Again, this is a mathematical approximation. So in, in the approximation, the points have a size zero for the simulation. I had to take a slightly positive size. So the corners are actually disks, which uh, have a small but non-zero radius. And by doing that, you actually have a small disk around the green point that is never hit by a uh, light ray. But you see, we started with 16 uh, particles or light rays. Now the number has decreased to four. There's this yellow trajectory here that seems to have a quite interesting behavior. I have another video on what happens to this trajectory later on, but I don't want to spoil it here. So how can we understand the property of this room? It turns out that if you start with a much simpler case, which is a billiard in the white isosceles triangle, you uh, actually can understand uh, most of what you need to uh, analyze the more complicated cases. So here is my white isosceles triangle. So it has angles of 90, 45, and 45 degrees to sides of equal length. The diagonal here is longer. And let's assume that this is a pool table and we want to play a game with slightly different rules from usual pool billiard. We want to start from a corner and we want to hit the ball in such a way that it will end up in a pocket in one of the other corners. So I've marked the pockets here in green, blue and red. Now there's one case which is very easy, that is starting from the green corner, we can shoot the ball in such a way that it will come back to the corner, right? We just need to shoot at 45 degrees so that it hits the opposite, the longer diagonal side at right angles and bounces back. And okay, we have just to quickly go away before the ball comes back at us and it will fall in the pocket here. But how about going from the green to the wet corner? Now, you can probably figure out that if you aim a little bit more to the white, you're going to hit 
the diagonal side and then bounce down here to this side and if you just do it just in the right way you will hit the corner the wet corner here and you can actually work this out with uh, you know find the different angles but there is an easier way of doing this and that is based on the method of unfolding so how does that work here i have started with my initial triangle and i've tiled part of the plane with copies of this triangle and it's a tiling by reflection so it means that i start with a triangle and then i flip it by leaving one side in the same place like if i flip it i keep the diagonal side here in place i get this triangle here and then i can flip it again to get this or this triangle and so on and i have marked the corners with the same colors as before so the green one is mapped to the green one here when i flip vertically the blue corner comes here and so on and i can do this for the whole plane so here i've just drawn a small number of copies of the triangle but i could put more and now i can see again what happens if i want to go from the green corner to itself well that's equivalent to just aiming my ball from the green corner to the opposite green corner here which is its image by reflection and automatically when i reflect back i will come back to the corner here now how about going from the green to the wet corner well now you see it's not so hard i can for instance aim from this green corner to the wet corner here by a straight line so it will have slope one half and then fold everything back like this so the short bit is mapped here the longer bit is mapped here and i get my trajectory ending in the wet corner so the answer is that just by aiming with a slope of one half i will succeed in reaching the wet corner and of course by symmetry i can also reach the blue corner i just have to aim with a slope of two in this direction and that's actually not the only solution I, I have other possibilities so i can aim from the green corner to the wet corner here so now the slope would be one quarter and again by folding back i will arrive in this corner but with a larger number of bounces so if you want to do this in real life the more bounces you have the more little errors in aiming will be important so you want to take actually the minimal number of bounces but there is you can easily figure out there's an infinite number of solutions all right so how about going from the blue to the wet corner well you can do this as well here's one possibility so i start in the blue i aim so now the slope is one third and i get a trajectory that will hit one two three walls and if i fold it back i get this solution so by aiming here at one third two thirds of the short side here i will bounce once twice three times and arrive in the wet corner and the same trajectory in reverse of course works to go from the red to the blue corner now how about going from the blue corner to itself so i try applying the same trick so i start from the blue corner here and i want to aim at one of the other blue points but you see we have a problem here because if i want to go to the blue point to the right the green corner here is in my way and if i want to go up here again there's a green point in the way and if i want to go to this one there's a wet point in the way and actually you can check that whatever blue point you're aiming at you will always first encounter a red or a green point so as a result 
it's impossible to find a trajectory going from the blue corner to itself. And for similar reasons, it's not possible to go from the red corner to itself as well. So here I've just drawn two things you could try to do. So aim uh, from this red corner to the left or to the right. There's always a green corner in the way, but there are of course more copies of the uh, so uh, more triangles, uh, upwards, downwards, but whatever you do, you will always first meet a green or a blue corner before you have a chance of going again to a wet point. Now, with this, we can already understand a somewhat simpler case, which is the following one. So here, uh, it's not yet Tokarski's room with a where you have a two points so you can't go from one point to the other. It's, it's a billiard with a non-self-illuminable point. So what happened here is that we started from the green point with uh, a few thousand particles. Again, particles hitting the corners are absorbed. And what you see here is that the particles never return to the green points they started started for. So let's see it again. So we started with 5,000 particles and you can see in the zoom that some of them come quite close to the green dot but they never reach it. So how do we explain that? Well here's the explanation. So I can actually pave my, my room, uh, let's call it the paper windmill, with white isosceles triangles as before. And again, I use this rule where I take symmetries, reflections, so each triangle is obtained from its neighbors by flipping and keeping one side fixed. And I have also color-coded the corners in a, in a similar way. So all right angles are green and the 45 degrees angles are red or blue, but in a way compatible with the unfolding. So actually each small triangle has one vertex of each color. And now you see why you can't return to, uh, from the, the center point here to itself because it would mean that you would have a trajectory going back to the wet point, and we have ju just seen that this is impossible. So starting from the wet point, it's impossible to return to the wet point, and it's also impossible to hit the four outer vertices here of the shape. Now let's look at Tokarski's solution again. So here it is. And you now see that you can again pave this room with triangles, which are isosceles white triangles, again in a way which is compatible with reflections. And if I use the same color coding, so green for white angles, blue or red for the other angles, but in such a way that each small triangle has one vertex of each color, I see that my pair of special points are both red and I know that it is impossible to go from the red point back to itself or to one of its copies. So at least I have shown that starting from the red point I cannot reach the other red point and incidentally I cannot reach the other wet points like this one or, or the vertices here. Now actually I haven't shown that it is possible to hit all other points. That is a slightly different argument, but it works in a similar way. Now one thing you could uh, think of by seeing this is, is it really necessary to have this complicated shape? For instance, could I remove the triangle down here. Well, the thing is, if, if the rule is that only the corners are absorbing, 
you see that you can't do it because if you remove this triangle then the green point is no longer absorbing and you have a trajectory going like this and bouncing back and reaching the red point. So actually, yes, all these extra triangles are necessary to really be sure that you can't go from the left red point to the right one. Now, using the same principle or at least similar ideas, you can build other rooms with the same properties. So here's another room that was found by Tokarski. So that one is made of triangles that don't have right angles. Actually, it is made of 86 triangles which all have the same shape and they all have angles of 9, 72 and 99 degrees. So they are 40 triangles arranged around a point in the left half here, 40 triangles in the right half and six triangles connecting them. And the principle is that you can show that the sharp angle here, the nine degree angle of this triangle is again not self-illuminable. So starting from that point you can't return to it. And so starting from the red point at the left, you can't reach the green point at the right and actually you can't reach either the vertex, the highest vertex up here. So again, it's a similar idea. It's a bit more uh, difficult to really analyze what happens in one of these triangles than just an unfolding, but the basic principle is the same. Now, I said at the beginning that we have to assume that we work within the framework of geometric optics. So if we use real waves instead of uh, light moving in straight lines, actually this property of points being non-illuminable no longer works. And this is because of the phenomenon of diffraction. So you see that when waves approach a corner, they can actually kind of turn around the corner. And what you see here is that it's no longer true that the middle of the right half of the room cannot be reached by the waves. Actually, there are plenty of waves reaching it. Nevertheless, if we move a bit to the energy representation here, you still see that the the energy is is a bit uh, small uh, smaller than uh, in the right half than it is in the, in the left half. Now, what does it mean that we can approximate the motion of light by geometric optics by straight lines? Sometimes we can do it, sometimes we can't do it. Well, it's a matter of wavelength. So the limit of geometric optics corresponds to having shorter and shorter wavelengths. So technically, if the wavelength goes to zero, diffraction becomes less and less important, and in the limit, you have no diffraction phenomena. And the same is actually true for quantum mechanics. So a quantum system will behave more and more like a classical system if the scale at which you're looking is such that the Planck constant h bar becomes smaller and smaller. And in that case, ultimately, uh, you are back to classical physics. Now, Penrose's solution is a little bit more stable because, as we've seen, uh, there are whole areas that cannot be reached by light for a given position of the source. So, for instance, here, what I have is a light source or wave source behind a, uh, this little structure that looks like a mushroom. So, in the limiting case of geometric optics, it would not be possible to cross the lines between these two vertices, which are focal points of the elliptic part of the, bar, the boundary here. Now, due to diffraction, when the wavelength is finite and not infinitely small, 
you can actually go around, you have diffraction, and it means that you can actually reach all points in, the, in this uh, billiard shape. However, you still notice that it's a bit more difficult for waves to, to reach points here on the other side of the mushrooms. If you wait long enough, they will ultimately go there, but still most of the energy remains, at least for a long time, in a, an area which is also reachable in the limit of geometric optics. Now, let me uh, come back to this result, this more recent result I mentioned by Le Lièvre, uh, Montaigne and, and Weiss, saying that in a polygon with rational angles, at most a finite number of points cannot be lit. So here's an example of a billiard in a maze. So it is a maze with angles of 90, uh, 90 degrees or some angles here, uh, multiples of 90 degrees. But they are all rational angles, so it's a complicated but allowed shape. So a polygon with rational angles. And so this result applies. And what it tells us is that there may be a few points that you cannot reach, starting from a given point, but this number of points is finite. So the simulation here only shows which cells are reached, and you see that all square cells of the maze are, are being reached. It doesn't check for every point within such, such a cell, but the result tells us that uh, indeed there may be a finite number of isolated points you cannot reach, but most point, points you will reach. And uh, so one last thing I wanted to say is that this result, which is, of course, a very powerful generalization of uh, these uh, particular cases we've discussed before, it actually builds on a series of very deep and abstract results that were obtained by Alex Eskin, Maria Mirzakhani, and, and Ami Mohammadi. And so, so the so Le Lièvre, Montaigne, and, and Weiss used uh, some of their results to to prove their theorem, and it's really beyond this uh, little video, and also beyond my expertise to explain what this result is about. But I can say one thing. So here, you see that in both papers they talk about SL2R. So what is SL2R? So the L here stands for linear, which means it's linear transformation, so that you can describe by matrices. The two means these are matrices of size two by two. R means they have real coefficients, and S means determinant one, it stands for special. So they look at matrices, two by two matrices, with real entries and determinant one. And they can be seen as describing linear transformations of the plane that are area preserving. So it could be translations, it could be rotations, but it can also be scalings which may be contract in one direction and expand in the other one with the same weight. So they are area conserving. And if I look at my particles or light rays in, uh, in the plane, the motion is somehow related to, to this, these transformations. But when I restrict this to a finite room with mirrored walls, it is somehow similar to looking at so a part of the plane where I identify some boundaries. So you may know the, the classical example of a torus that you obtain by starting by a square or rectangle and you glue together opposite sides. So you can do similar constructions for other polygons than rectangles with more sides and you get something called a translation surface. 
And the results by these people are very uh, deep and uh, very general results on this kind of you know, transformation of such a translation surface by such an area preserving map. All right, so that's all for today. I hope you liked it. Feel free to comment and see you again.